Ginger is the root of so many recipes with a million uses. It's also very easy to grow and will crop year after year after year, saving you a lot of money. But more than that, it's exceptionally flavorful when you grow it yourself and harvest it. Let me show you how. Did you know there are more than 1,000 different types of gingers, both edible and inedible? Incredible, right? And we will be visiting some of those when we go to the Living Collection at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, later in the video. You really won't want to miss it. But what all gingers have in common is they spread by these. You might think this is a root, it's actually a rhizome. And the rhizome is just a modified stem that creeps along at or just below the soil surface. And as it goes, it sends out shoots like that and roots down below. And you can see that here, the little shoot coming out. And this makes it a very efficient way to spread out. And we'll use this to grow some. When we're starting off ginger, we want to use a really chunky piece of rhizome because it will have more buds on it and will get you off to a quicker start and give you a bigger plant, which means it's less time to harvest. Now come closer, because I want to show you something. You notice here these little kind of, almost like little white horns, like a rhino's horn. Well, this is where the shoots come from. So if you can see some of these, then that's a really good sign. Each piece, ideally when you plant it, wants to have at least two of these, but obviously the more the merrier, because the chunkier the plant. This size root here is optimal, look at it. And there's loads of these little nodules, some smaller than others, but they're definitely there. You can start ginger off just using bits of rhizome from the uh, grocery store. Now you're looking for nice, firm roots. Any that are shriveled up or looking a bit suspect, don't use those. If you can, root around, pun intended, in a, in a tray of gingers where they're sold loose, because then you can get the big, chunky bits like this. If they're sold pre-bagged, there's often just little bits of it, which isn't really any good. Organic's best, and if you can't find decent chunky bits like this, then try looking in um, Asian grocery stores as well, or you can just buy it online or source it from a garden centre as well. Once you've got your rhizomes, soak them overnight in tepid water, and that will just help to wash off any kind of growth inhibitor that has been used on them. Ginger grows in Southeast Asia in the sort of forest floor where it's really humid. And down there, there's all sorts of leaf litter and the soil is kind of open and spongy almost. So it's well drained, but it gets lots of moisture too. So we're gonna mimic this in the growing medium I'm using. For richness, I've got this beautiful garden made compost that I've just uh, sibbed or screened through. Look at that, it's so beautiful, so rich but then to make sure it's well drained, I'm gonna add in some very fine bark chippings. So for our perfect mix, I'm gonna take about half garden compost and then mix this with another half of these wood chippings here. These are quite well composted. So I'm gonna add some of those and then just top it up to the 50% there with uh, this slightly rougher, coarser, uh, chippings as well and then mix it all up and we've got that kind of Goldilocks zone of good draining medium but nice richness as, a, as well that these sort of gingers absolutely love it's coming together lovely because the ginger rhizome spread out what we want to go for is wider pots that are relatively shallow rather than sort of um, normal stumpier pots so something like this is absolutely ideal and then take our nice chunky bit of ginger. This one's probably one of the best. And then we want it just at or slightly below soil surface. We don't want it any deeper than that. Otherwise the rhizome is liable to rot away. Now these have been soaking overnight in tepid water, so they're ready to go. And you can see the way I've planted it here. You just see the rhizome kind of suggestively poking through at the top there, but it is mostly covered over. And now all I need to do is just give it a bit of a drink. It goes without saying, make sure your container has a good drainage hole in it because these do like it well drained. Now, the best time to start ginger off is very early spring or even late winter indoors in the warm. 
and then you can move them outside to say a greenhouse, a cold frame, or maybe a sunroom or conservatory. Of course, if you're somewhere much warmer than outdoors is fine and we'll be discussing placement shortly. However, I think it's fine to start them in autumn like it is now if you have got somewhere warm to overwinter them. And for this chunky container here, I'm gonna put two kind of uh, lots of rhizome in, get them covered up. So as I said, ginger grows on the understory of tropical rainforests, so it likes that really high humidity, but it doesn't like direct sun, or at least in hotter climates. In my more benign temperate climate, you can get away with a bit of sunshine, especially at this sort of more autumnal time of year, but in midsummer, even here, it pays to give them a little shade. Now I've got my gingers in this corner of the greenhouse. It gets a nice lot of morning sunshine, but in the afternoon it's uh, mostly shaded, and that has served them really well over the summer. So I've got different types here. This is my normal root ginger here, but I've also got this turmeric here, which is actually also a type of ginger, and you can tell by the kind of rhizome it produces there. If you're in a cooler climate like mine, then they really do need that extra warmth from say a greenhouse or conservatory or sunroom. But if you're in a hot climate, then of course grow them outdoors, but do keep them shaded from the hot sun, otherwise you will get crisped, burnt up leaves. It's quite warm still now, so I'm gonna start these off in here, but when it gets a bit cooler, we will be overwintering them, and more on that shortly. So let's take watering now. With these just planted rhizomes, they obviously haven't got any shoots or roots yet, so we don't want to overwater it, just keep it lightly moist. If you overwater it, they could rot away, but in this really well draining mix, I think we'll be okay. Once they've started growing like these guys here, they will need regular watering because what we want to do is mimic the forest floor where they grow, where they get these big intense tropical downpours pretty regularly as much as every day. So in really hot weather, they do get watered every day. And if I show you this turmeric here, you can see the leaves have gone a bit yellow and crisped at the end, and that's a sign of water stress. I've given it a soak already, but I'm gonna go through and water these again just to make sure. Um, yeah, and obviously when you're watering more, that raises the humidity, which they absolutely love as well. As it starts to cool off, of course, you won't need to water nearly as often. It's quite hard to overwater with this lovely barky mixture as well. Another way, of course, to up the humidity is just to, in hot weather, just go through like this, give them a bit of a spray. That'll keep them really, really happy. It's almost tropical now, you can feel it, right? <laughs> Gingers are relatively hungry plants, as I've already said, so the compost will really help them, but eventually they will need a little bit of extra feed. You can mix in a slow-release organic fertilizer, or I just apply a liquid seaweed feed onto them during the growing season from time to time to help them along. The other thing is, once they reach the edge of their pots, then do pot them on into a wider pot, because obviously they keep spreading out and that will increase your harvest. We're well into autumn now, and many gingers, including common root ginger, may well go dormant as light levels and temperatures drop. Now I'll be showing you how to overwinter them shortly and to keep them going year after year, but first, let's head over and look at the spectacular living collection of gingers at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Crikey, <laughs> certainly, yeah. Uh happening in here, isn't it? <laughs> wow. Yeah, we've got just under a thousand plants in here, about 250 named species, and about 130 species which have yet to be determined. So when you say yet to be determined, they're like, they haven't been, got a name even, they're yep. just, wow. Yeah, <laughs> so there's a possibility that there's, there's more new species yeah. waiting here to be found. Pretty named. exciting stuff, really. I yeah, mean, it that's is, kind of it a, is. Something, a, a new species, don't get that every day. This, just as an aside, this is one of the sort of side families, Loeaceae, Orchidantha. It's got quite a sort of pungent kind of smell if you can get your nose in that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> 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 
Oh yeah, that's uh, that's um, pokey. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I, I think it's it's trying to mimic the smell of carrion. Okay, um, right. Yeah, yeah. To, it's to, to, doing a good job, I think. Yeah. Oh. So uh, one of the things that is a little bit of a secret um, is that ginger flowers are sometimes extremely tasty. Right. Not all of them are extremely tasty, but I know for a fact that these ones are because I ate one earlier. Would you like to pull one of these off? Oh yes. That Right, just pop the whole thing in? Yep. Oh wow, it's got the slight warmth of ginger, but it's sweet as well. It's really palatable. Yep, <laughs> Would like another. Oh yes, please, yeah. Simon's brought us into the collection here where he's laid out some edible gingers and uh, they're looking really rather delicious. Let's take a look. Well, there's a lovely selection here. Tell us what we got here, Simon. Okay, so I pulled out some of the the most commonly used uh, species in terms of, you know, being edible. Uh, we'll start here. This is ginger, Zingiber officinale. This is the one that we all know from um, being able to go and buy in the shops. But you can you can grow them, you know, quite successfully in a pot. I'll take it out of the pot so we can see. Yeah, the great. Yeah, yeah. We can see the piece where uh, where all the business takes place. So if we just gently push this out of the way, this is that loose barky mix that we use here and there there's the ginger wow nice and chunky <laughs> nice and chunky Great. yeah <laughs> so this goes dormant every year between about october and march um, and at that time we usually bring it out of the pot like this divide it and repot it i see and it's much stronger flavor to eat fresh ginger than it is to eat shop bought ginger. I've heard but the skin's a lot thinner as well when you grow it yourself. Yeah, you don't need to peel yeah, it. Like. You can just, literally, you can just brush the skin off here and it, and it comes away. It's much more spicy. It's much more sort of heat about it. Another one here is Gal and Gal, um, which is used a lot in sort of Southeast Asian cooking. Curcuma longa. <laughs> so this is um, turmeric. Again, really important plant in you know lots of traditional sort of cooking styles and, and different cuisines from around the world. So again, we really need to see the uh, the rhizome to to get a better idea of of what that does. And even just this little bit of rhizome that I've exposed at the side, you can see that characteristic much yellower, yeah. much more yellow sort of colour to it. And this has got sort of superfood status in the last few years or so what's what's it meant to do for us it's meant to be an antioxidant like other gingers it's thought to be a digestive aid a little bit of a hipster fad you know having uh, turmeric shots and adding turmeric to different things so yeah a, a fatty thing at the moment but people have been eating these for a, you know at least five thousand years probably an awful lot longer than that so it's not a fad, it's, yes. you know, it's here to stay, it's a cornerstone of many sort of cultures, um, you know, cuisines and, and what have you. A lot of our collection is in pots, all kinds of different reasons, but when we get to put them in the ground, they really do what they want to do, which is to wander through forest floors and understory plant, yeah. you know, it likes to live under the canopy. And so in some cases it likes to get really big, you know, fronds of sort of four and five meters. And then, the, you know, other species which are much sort of shorter, only a few inches tall. It's quite a variety of uh, <laughs> Absolutely. shapes and sizes, isn't Absolutely, it? Yeah. yeah. So for home growers wanting to try ginger, what are some like, tips and tricks they can do to get it just right, especially in cooler climates? If you're growing in a pot, one of the key things is to keep repotting regularly okay. and dividing the plant. Like I say, they want to spread out like this. Mm -hmm. And if you leave it in a pot too long, it will become congested and won't perform as well. So for our potted collection here, we repot everything every year. About half of the collection that we have goes dormant between October and March. We, we sort of ease back on the watering, we keep the humidity up, uh, but don't let anything dry out completely. So in a home environment, would it be a question of waiting for the top growth to die back, cutting it back, dropping down the watering and maybe keeping it somewhere steamy like a bathroom or somewhere like that? Is yes, that, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just keeping it a minimum temperature of what sort of... Well, our, our research glass house is a minimum of 22. 22, yeah. so that's sort of 70 Fahrenheit. That's, yeah. that's quite that's high. Toasty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we're looking to achieve, you know, about 80% humidity or okay. higher.
Wow, what an incredible experience that was. The greenhouse is enormous, and that's only a small percentage of the total number of gingers out there, and more are being discovered every year. Ginger doesn't like it below about 40 Fahrenheit or five degrees Celsius. They'll just turn to mush. And who wants to heat a greenhouse with those sort of energy costs? So as Simon suggests, I'm gonna bring these indoors for the winter where it's nice and snug and warm. We've got our gingers all set up and I've gone for somewhere that gets as much light as possible. Now in the winter, as the light levels are so low, there's no chance of sort of scorching them. So you actually want to switch to giving them the sunniest spot possible. I had considered the bathroom because it's nice and steamy, obviously, and you get that lovely high humidity, but it's a bit dark in there. So I've opted for here. And to get around that, I've just put them in this tray of these expanded sort of clay pebbles. You could just use rocks, anything, and then just fill the tray with water. And you want to get it so the water level comes up to close to the bottom of the pot, but not actually touching it. So they're still clear of it. And now what will happen is as that water evaporates, it'll raise the humidity really nicely. So just keep that topped up. Now you'll notice I'm near a heat source here. This is turned off and that's important because if it's near a heat source, you'll get big whip saws of temperature. This will get too hot and scalded and it'll dry out the air. So it's really important to keep it away from a heat source or the heat source turned off. As winter gets nearer, you'll see some leaves dying off and you can pick them off. And if the whole stem dies back, then you can just cut it off towards the soil level there. That's absolutely fine. Keep them ticking over. And then as spring arrives and the light imp improves a bit, you'll see new shoots coming up. That's great. You can then pot them on if necessary. And then once there's no danger of frost and they've been acclimatized, they can go back out to where they're gonna be all summer long the greenhouse or outdoors if you're nice and toasty in your climate. Ginger is typically ready to harvest towards the end of the growing season once it's had a nice long time to grow. These were planted a little bit late. So what I'm gonna be doing is just overwintering them as I've shown you, and then I should get a harvest next summer or next autumn. When you come to harvest, you've got two options. Just peel away the growing medium and snap off a bit of root that you want to use, or alternatively, take everything out, shake off all the growing medium, and then harvest your rhizomes, and then replant a good chunk of it back for your next crop. That way you can keep your plants going season after season indefinitely. Many recipes call for grated ginger. Now I find that the natural stringiness of ginger root kind of gets in the way a bit, making it a little bit tricky. But there's an ingenious way to get around this. Freezing. Ginger root can be frozen as it is whole, no need to do anything to it. But then watch this, when you come to grate it, it just grates so much more easily. None of that stringiness. And then once you've got what you need, just pop it back into the freezer. The other option is to slice your ginger roots nice and evenly into thin slices and then dehydrate it till it's nice and crisp. Then give it a whiz up in a spice grinder and you've got your own ground ginger. Store it somewhere dry and out of direct light. Let me know if you will be growing ginger in the comments below and why not grow that perfect partner to ginger, garlic. Find out everything you need to know in this video. Mm. I'll catch you next time.